Hi, everyone. Hi, Frank. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, it's great to be here. Good morning. And we were just talking how this is a really fun format. It's the first time that you've done it, an earnings with CNBC this way. Is that right? It is indeed. It's usually a live television. And uh, I think uh, <laughs> this is a little bit more relaxed and uh, I'm looking forward to it. So, so how are you then? Because I get to ask it. We're not on live TV where we have to, you know, fit everything into a few minutes. I'm good. Uh, we're, we're very busy at Zynga. You know, we're doing a lot of, of new things. Uh, the business is going very well. Uh, we're entertaining millions of people every day with our games. It's it's a really exciting time for the company uh, where we are right now. Yeah, um, it certainly is. And the results last night, I know that the street is excited about them. And, you know, the first thing that I wanted to dive into um, was the Apple iOS privacy changes, which we have spent a lot of time talking about right. on CNBC. And you know, the narrative for a long time was Facebook versus Apple, but we've now talked to a number of companies that aren't actually scared of this change, but actually see a way to benefit from it. And you guys are part of that group with this chart boost acquisition that will help you handle the tracking change. And you actually raised your forecast. So you're not worried about these iOS changes, right? No, we're not. I, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot still to be learned about how it's going to unfold and what the different dynamics will be. But in general, it's a it's a change to, to privacy rules that our players care about. And uh, from our perspective, you know, we're a company that offers a lot of different products and services to a lot of people. They're busy adults. Pr product, our major uh, audience are, are women. And so it's privacy is important in their lives. And, and so we we definitely embrace the changes from a positive customer standpoint. At the same time, for our perspective, it just changes the rules in terms of how we have to operate. It doesn't fundamentally change the great games that we make. Uh, and the services that we provide. So some of the moves that we've made recently, like the acquisition of Chart Boost, gives us the opportunity to better serve our players and our customers by understanding the whole journey that they go through from, from the moment they see an ad impression on Instagram all the way through the time that they're in our games and make sure that that experience is as high quality and and within the privacy rules that, uh, that Apple's setting out. So uh, yeah, I think it's gonna be a, a challenge for some companies to, to manage this change, but uh, fortunately, we're a very large company with uh, 164 million monthly active users in our games business, and Chart Boost has over 700 million uh, users every month, and they're handling 90 billion ad auctions every month. So that's a that's a lot of interactions with the market that gives us a chance to really understand what's going on and make good decisions. And Frank, as you said, though, you said a lot of your audience um, are women, and they sort of want these privacy um, controls in place. So. What's telling you that they want targeted advertising? I mean, that's been a big question. Who's going to opt in? Who's going to opt out? But your acquisition essentially makes it so that you can continue targeting advertising, perhaps in a more effective way. But what makes you think people want it in the first place? Well, I, I think the, 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 you're going to be receiving advertising in the games because that's one of the ways in which uh, we monetize our business. And to receive ads that are relevant and interesting to you is a better thing than receiving ads that we're guessing at. Um, and so if you opt in um, to wanting to receive ads that use a little bit of your user information, we'll be able to provide you with ads that make sense in the context of your day and your life and, and what you might be interested in. Um, and it's it's fairly benign type of information that we're looking at. We're looking at how you're playing in the game and, and who your relationships with are in terms of your friends. Um, and then trying to figure out uh, what you might be interested in from an advertiser standpoint. So when we look at that type of information, that's really what we're trying to, to provide is more relevant and context uh, interesting ads um, as opposed to to uh, some of the guesswork that would occur. Right. And this move, though, it actually goes beyond advertising, right? This is actually going to help you figure out what games people like to play, what they respond to, right? So there's sort of a bigger objective here, too. Absolutely. I, I think Chart Boost is really, uh, you know, somebody described it as a, a strategic pivot from the company from moving from just being a publisher to becoming a mobile platform. And I think that's a very accurate uh, description of what we're doing. By being a platform, we can actually understand by looking at the uh, traffic, uh, what's hot and what's not in terms of the marketplace, what games are doing well, what games are starting to emerge and become popular, what trends are interesting to people? Is it a particular category or a style of play? So having that additional data, uh, which we can then combine with the massive scale data that we have from our games, really gives us a much better understanding of what's going on in the mobile ecosystem and, and how to navigate a, 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 you know, a course that can increase the value of the company and make our products and services better. Right, that's interesting that you bring up sort of platform versus publisher. 
you have had sort of this really interesting M&A strategy that has served you quite well. Do you think that, do you foresee yourselves going more into the publishing side of things, growing organically in the future? Well, I, you know, we've had really good organic growth. Uh, the the inorganic growth that we've done through acquisition of game developers like Peak and Small Giant and Graham and, and most recently Rollick has really been a, a nice combination of elements, right? We have our, our tried and true brands like Words with Friends, Zynga Poker, CSR Racing, which is definitely organic growth. And then they've really sat alongside these new companies that we brought in that have joined us. Um, and they've really helped each other, right? They learn from what we've done on Words with Friends inside of, of Peak's Toon Blast game, for example. Um, by publishing those games together as a collective portfolio, what we really try and do on the platform side is make sure that all the information is being generated in the games, like what features are working, if we make a mistake in a game, how can we learn from it and do better next time? All of that is shared across all the teams, and we create a lot of interesting tools for the teams to be able to run their live services because this is a 24-7, 365 type of business where something can uh, go great at 2 a.m. in Turkey and, and we want that to propagate through the rest of the company so we understand how to stay on top of it. It's a very fast moving market. And so from that perspective, you know, the platform part of it really gets enhanced when we vertically integrate into ad tech with Chartboost because now we really understand what's going on in user acquisition, in how advertising is being filled, uh, what advertisers are really popular, which games are popular, uh, and it just makes for better decision making ultimately. You just called this a 24-7, 365 day business, right? <laughs> Did I hear that right? So <laughs> certainly over the last year, uh, yes. when people are home and they got lots of time on their hands, talk about engagement going forward. I know that the last quarter was very strong, even as we see parts of the US reopen, Asia Pack. Um, get there as well. You haven't seen a trail off, but what are you expecting for the rest of the year? Your business model, especially the mobile game, do you anticipate that sort of engagement to continue? Well, I, I think what's interesting about what we're seeing right now is as, as people you know, all over the world in certain countries which are coming uh, out of, of, out of uh, the pandemic, this transitory uh, period where people are going back to school, back to work, uh, returning to their normal lives, they're they're bringing their mobile games with them. I think during the pandemic, they found that mobile game entertainment is actually very rewarding. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's very inexpensive. It's a free to play experience that uh, you can spend when you want, and when you don't, you don't. Uh, and in addition to that, the social dynamic is really amazing. The number of people that have commented to us about how they stayed in touch with their mm -hmm. sisters or their moms or their brothers through words with friends or, or Harry Potter, puzzles and spells, those social interactions are real and valuable to people. And so being able to, you're going to bring your phone back with you wherever you go in, in this, in this post-transition uh, period, um, to be able to access all of your fun and your social network and your, and your groups of friends through our games, um, that happens. And in, in a time where uh, economics are in a state of flux, there's a lot of uh, d dislocation, free to play mobile games that are ad supported or even microtransaction supported, you know, is a pretty efficient way to entertain yourself. And you can steal away, you know, a few minutes here waiting for a train or uh, in between classes. Um, it, it's a very flexible and accessible form of entertainment that really blends into your lifestyle in a way that you want it to, as opposed to having to you know, park yourself in front of the television or or have to be home in order to engage with it. So that flexibility is really important. And I think it's it's showing the resiliency of, of our industry uh, as you move through some of these huge shocks to the to the society that we have in the world. And, and that that's encouraging to us. And it manifests itself yeah. that over the last several quarters, we haven't seen engagement go down uh, as states have opened up, as countries have opened up. Uh, and that gives us optimism for the rest of the year. And that's one of the reasons why we raised uh, our annual guidance uh, uh, by about $100 million uh, this last quarter from $2.8 billion to uh, $2.9 billion. Yeah, um, and that, that, that's a great point. Um, I do want to get to the social aspect of the Zynga gaming platform as well, but I got to ask you first, um, another big topic for us has been this battle between Apple and Epic and the iOS app store. How closely are you following all of this drama? To be honest with you, I've been so busy with uh, chart boost and and you know serving our you know getting our games going, serving our customers that uh, I haven't really paid that much attention to it. Uh, it's obviously a dynamic time in the mobile ecosystem between all of the these huge players like but Facebook it, and Google and everybody. The, the outcome has the ability to affect you and your business in a it major does. way. 
It does. Um, so, and I think it, a few years ago, you said that it remains to be seen if more companies will side with Epic. And we have really seen that from Spotify to Match uh, to Tile and just sort of this big question around the 30% commission. So mm -hmm. where do you stand on this now? Would it be a good thing if some of these commissions or rules or around payments were ruled back? Well, I, I think, you know, a couple of ways to think about it are, you know, it's not a forecastable event, what will happen. So it's a very complicated case and it, it could unfold in any, many, in many different directions. At the same time, uh, we have a very good working relationship with Apple. Uh, we are in a position where we're the in the top five worldwide publishers on mobile. Apple is a major part of our of our business and we have good relationships with them. And when we have feedback on their systems and they have feedback on our products, we do that. We, we have a very good open two way exchange. If anything happens uh, in terms of an outcome with regards to this trial, it'll it'll likely be a tailwind as you as you as you call out for our business. And but it's an unforecastable event, um, and so from our perspective, we're going to continue business as usual until we find out definitively what this all means, and then then we'll make adjustments. But why stay on the sidelines when it does have the ability to be a tailwind for you guys? And wouldn't it be nice to pay less commission than the current thirty percent? I, I think the the issue is what value do you get for the thirty percent? Um, and so, from my perspective, when we look at our relationship with Apple, um, we have a lot of very positive things in the relationship, and there's things that we work on privately together, company to company. Um, so, from my perspective, we'll see what happens with the trial, and whatever answer comes out, um, like I said, we'll we'll incorporate into how we operate going forward. Are you referring to the Apple, the App Store ecosystem, and the sort of standards that they place on it? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of different outcomes, uh, not just the the fees, but also publishing rights and billing. There's a lot of really complicated and interesting issues at play here. Um, and I think that, you know, we're we're in this position where we'd like to see some aspects of, of the relationship evolve. And there's other parts of the relationship that are great. Um, and that's that's how we manage it with Apple directly and, and Google and, and our other partners. Very diplomatic, Frank. I can I can appreciate that. Um, we only have a few minutes left tonight. I wanted to get to some fun stuff because sure. we're in this format. Um, you know, we've been covering the metaverse very closely and right. how Roblox and Fortnite are really pioneering this space. And you talked about the social aspect of your games and you've had a big success with Harry Potter. How do you or do you not play into that, you know, perhaps far off idea of, you know, we might all be operating in the metaverse. Do you need to, is that something that you're thinking about with your games? I, I think we're definitely thinking about it. And, and the metaverse idea is a really compelling idea. And there's there's some major properties out there that are very well positioned to become metaverses, like Roblox is probably the furthest along. And, and you can start to see Fortnite where they're having concerts in the game. It's, it's you know, there's activities other than the game itself. Um, Microsoft has a great one in Minecraft. You know, you could argue that that's a, that's a metaverse as well with all the user generated content that they have. Um, so I think if you look at overall interactive entertainment, there are some some amazing trends in technology that are coming that will allow us to create all new entertainment experiences, not just the metaverse, but things like NFTs and, and augmented reality and virtual reality. Those have yet to arrive yet at scale. Um, 5G networks, as they roll out, are making the games faster, better, more immersive. We can play with more people. And so if you look at the growth drivers beyond what we are already doing as an industry, uh, there's a lot of growth in the next five to 10 years that is yet to be realized. And that's what I think is so exciting about interactive entertainment is that the market is far from saturated. Um, it's glowing. It's growing ex expansively internationally. India, uh, the Middle East, Africa, these are all markets that are coming online with, with hundreds of millions of users. Uh, and so from my perspective, when I look at Zynga and where we're positioned, um, we're very excited about what's next. And metaverses are definitely part of that equation. So, so could we see a Zynga metaverse? Are you working on one? Where could it come from? Well, we've been Harry Potter. Yes, that's, yes. that's compelling for my five-year-old, by the way. If, uh, <laughs> that's a little that. for us. Uh, we're typically busy adults, but you know, I, I think it. You know, metaverses appeal to eight to eighty, right? You know, people love the idea of, of the fantasy of being able to go off and, and be somebody else and have fun and explore relationships with other people at, while doing really cool challenges and adventures. So. Um, we, we our mission is to connect the world through games and, and, and metaverses will be part of that. OK, great. And last question for you. As we talk about metaverses and NFTs, um, how are you thinking about Bitcoin cryptocurrencies in terms of either accepting that for payment, holding it in reserves, the technology behind it? 
Yeah, no, I, I think blockchain is, a, is an amazing technology. And I think someday uh, you're going to see blockchain in games because it allows you to have unique items. Um, if I have a, a car in our CSR game that there's only one of in the world, like the Mustang from the movie Bullet or, you know, one of the game cars from the Fast and the Furious, you, could, you can imagine how ex exciting and invaluable that would be inside of a game. So I think blockchain will be a really interesting technology uh, for games over, over the long term. In terms of the actual currencies and, and using those for either a treasury strategy or in, in, in um, accepting it as, as payment for, for our services in game, um, those are definitely things that we're considering and looking at. And, and several companies in our industry have already started to move in that direction. So mm -hmm. it's something we're, we're studying definitely. Okay, well, keep us posted. Um, one last question for you, Frank. I've been looking at your shot over oh. your right right shoulder. What yes. is that? No, no, the other one, the other one. Sorry. Oh, oh, that's a computer my son and I built. Um, so it's, oh, wow. uh, yeah, we, we, <laughs> this is an office that I share with my kids and this is where we do all our game testing and homework and, and goof off. So we, we How built old that. Is your son? Uh, he's 16. He's got a twin sister and we have an older uh, daughter, 17 as well. So it's a, it's it's a computer business. that you built. Okay. Yeah, we're gonna... we, ordered, we ordered the parts off Amazon and, and different, has got Corsair parts and Nvidia and, uh, you know, it's like putting together a car or, you know, you just put it together and let it run. All right. So should we, we should be tracking your son, your 16 year old as the next uh, generation of CNBC guests. Uh, yeah, I definitely, I'm betting on it. <laughs> <laughs> I also like the stormtrooper. I almost called my five year old up to take a look at that. <laughs> Frank, it's thank you so fun. much for doing this. This was a blast. I hope we get to do it again soon and exciting times at Zenga. We look forward to see, seeing what the next few quarters and years hold. 